Hi, I'm Phil Lowe. This is the Furniture Institute of Massachusetts, and this is the Art of Woodworking. Uh, in this episode, what I'd like to show you is some, uh, you know, talk about some chisels and uh, the different types of chisels that we use when we're doing different types of woodworking processes. And uh, also, I'm going to show you how to do mortise and tenon joints this, in this episode as well. Um, let's talk about uh, some mortise, uh, uh, some different types of chisels to begin with. Um, if you look at the, uh, the bench here, uh, what you'll notice is that I have an array of different chisels. They're, um, you know, different types of chisels for different purposes. And uh, these two, these three chisels that we have here are what they call firmer chisels. And the way that uh, we determine those is by the square edge, and they're relatively wide, and they have about a, uh, about a 25 degree bevel on them. Now this is really what they call a framing chisel. Um, it's a lot more stout. It has a leather washer in here. It has also what they call a tang, which is a sort of a sharpened point that goes into the handle. But you'll also notice that the handle has this uh, ring on the end. So if I want to do really aggressive cuts, you know, it'll prevent the, the, uh, the handle from splitting. Okay, a couple other uh, chisels that we have here are what they call bench chisels, and you'll notice uh, that these bench chisels um, have these bevels on them, and these are designed so that you can get into really tight places in case you have an angle, uh, like on a dovetail or something like that, you can uh, work right up against the, uh, the really sharp corner. Um, and all these chisels, what you'll see uh, is different ways in which they attach the handles as well. Uh, the handles on these firmer chisels are what they call tang, um, you know, attachments, and these are what they call socket attachments here, where, um, you know, the, the handle actually goes into a, a conical shape opening in the end of the, uh, the chisel itself. Uh, then we also have uh, these, uh, a real refined chisel that you see here, which is actually a, um, a paring chisel, and this is one that I actually made out of an old jointer knife and put a handle on. And uh, this one here we don't use with any, any type of uh, ma mallet or hammer or anything like that. It's all done uh, strictly by hand. And then we have these uh, three chisels here. Uh, well, actually, these four chisels. These are really interesting chisels. These are uh, some antique uh, mortising chisels. And as you can see, these are really designed to do some really you know, aggressive work. The handles on them are really big and heavy. And I, I particularly like this one because of the, all the facets that are on it. You can actually see that this was hand, uh, hand shaped with a plane and so forth. But again, these are tang chisels so that it has this bolster or this, this rounded area so that when you drive, uh, you know, with a, uh, a mallet, you know, that's going to actually, uh, uh, you know, transfer the, uh, you know, the, uh, the work down into uh, what you're really trying to chop. And these three particular ones have three different sizes. We have a, a, th a three eighths uh, inch wide one, a quarter inch wide one, or five sixteenths, and then an eighth inch wide one. So depending on the size of the mortise that we want to cut, will be, will really depend on the one that we uh, choose. Now this is a contemporary, um, uh, mortising chisel that is made by Lee Nielsen. As you can see, it's a little, uh, not quite as stout as the others, uh, but it does the work just as well. Um, one of the other things that you'll also notice is the, uh, the way that these are sharpened. Uh, they don't really have a, a huge hollow grind like you see on this one. Um, it's uh, much more, you know, straight or curved uh, type of um, bevel that's put on it and uh, the very end of it is really the only thing that gets sharpened. So uh, what I'm gonna do now is uh, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about uh, mortise and tenon joints. And a mortise and tenon is basically an opening that's chopped or uh, into, the, uh, into a leg like this cabriole leg here. And then you have uh, a, a tenon that fits into that mortise that like you see here. And um, 
this is a, a way that they used to join uh, you know, pieces and parts together. Uh, and it's a really important joint in, in furniture making because it's used so exclusively to, you know, actually join two parts together. Okay, I'm going to just show you a little drawing about a, uh, a, a mortise and tenon joint. And if you look closely here, what we have is an orthographic projection, which means that we have a front view, a plan view, and a right end view. So we're looking at the, uh, the mortise and tenon from the, uh, the end of this. Uh, you'll notice that I have uh, a bare face tenon, which means that the tenon comes directly off of the bottom of this, uh, the board that it's uh, attached to. And then uh, we have a couple other uh, terms that we would like you to know about, which is uh, the, the, the uh, tenon cheeks, which is the two sides, the wide sides of the, uh, the tenon. And then we have the tenon shoulders, which are uh, the, the parts that actually butt up against the, um, the, uh, the leg. Then we have the, right, the style and the rail, uh, and that would be for a door of some sort. Well, what I'd like to do now is just to show you how I'd go about laying out a mortise and tenon. Um, I have a, a sample uh, here that I'll, I'll use. And, uh, well, let's just talk a little bit about where mortise and tenons are actually used. If we look at this table down here, uh, this table was constructed with mortise and tenon joints as well. So, you know, the side rail going into the, the two legs uh, has a mortise and tenon joint on it. And then these, uh, in, these uh, dividers here and here uh, have a, what we call a twin tenon. So I have, I have a couple examples of those. And uh, you'll notice that, uh, you know, we have just a basic tenon here which has um, the three shoulders. It's bare-faced on the bottom. So we have uh, the tenon with the three shoulders on here. We have the mortise here. And then uh, we can also have what they call a, a twin tenon, which is a tenon, two tenons that are actually side by side, if you can see that. And uh, that actually is d uh, designed so that when the the rail is put into position that it doesn't twist. Uh, we have a, also a decorative uh, mortise and tenon here, which is used in a lot of Chinese style furniture, which is a mortise and tenon with a mitered shoulder. And then uh, we can also have some unusual tenons where if you look at this one, it actually has a, uh, an angle to the rail. So when the mortise is actually cut, you can see that it has an angle on it. So what I, I have here is this sample of this chair, and I'm going to take it apart so that you can actually see how it's, uh, it's put together. Uh, the back has uh, been glued up on this, but if you look, I can take off the crest rail, which has uh, a couple of mortise and tenons here, here, and for the splat. The splat is actually mortise and tenoned into the back rail with this stub tenon on either end. And then if I take the, the, uh, the rails and the stretches out, you'll notice that each one of these has a, uh, you know, an angled tenon on it as well as a uh, twisted tenon which is uh, the, one of the difficulties in chair making. Uh, the front rail is mortise intended into here. You can see the four uh, mortises that go into the legs for the stretches in the side rails. And then we have the side rails that go into these mortises in the back. And the interesting things about these is that they actually are twisted and angled in order to fit into the mortises of the back post. So, you know, this is, uh, this is a completely joined chair, and uh, we, you know, this is really the best type of construction that you can find on any type of furniture. So what I'd like to do now is show you how to lay out a mortise and tenon. I have what I uh, would call a leg for a, a table of some sort, and then I also have a rail. And what I want to do is to try to get this piece to fit inside of this piece over here. Um, and to do that, um, I'm going to start off by uh, trying to chop out the mortise, but I have to do a layout first. And the layout lines are really the most important thing here, because if I can lay out the lines really accurately and cut to those lines, 
uh, you know, the joint is going to fit perfectly. So uh, to start off with, what I'll do is I'll take the rail size and I'll put it up against the top of the leg and align it and then take a knife and make, make a small knife cut across here and then take a square and transfer that to the other side here. So this is where the, uh, the, the, the mortise is actually going to stop on the bottom. Then I'm going to go ahead and take a uh, marking gauge and I'm going to set it for a one inch mark. So I'll actually take and set it at one inch. And I'm just going to put a little mark right here. And then I'm going to take the square and I'm going to work my way around the, uh, the, the, this uh, blank. Now you notice that I have a line here and a little, uh, so this is my flat surface, this is my square edge. Now one thing I'd like to show you is that uh, we need to wrap a shoulder line around here and when we wrap the shoulder line we have to keep the head of the square only on two surfaces. We want it on uh, this one surface and one edge. And uh, if we do that we'll be able to make sure that the lines that we wrap around will meet up almost every time. And uh, this is a pretty good example of how uh, I can demonstrate that. If you'll take a look at this, uh, this board here, you'll notice that I have uh, playing quite a curve into the edge of it. And um, with that curve in the edge of it, if I um, actually start laying out a line, which might be a shoulder line off of this curved edge, and I put a pencil line across here, and then I go to the other side, and I keep working my way around, you're gonna notice that what happens on this edge here, you can see that the lines don't match up. Now, if I only use this, angle, or this curved surface for, uh, with the head of my square against it, and I only use one surface to lay it out off of uh, with the broad surface. I put a line across there. And then again, if I use that curved surface and bring my pencil line across like so, and then across this side, you're going to notice that the line actually matches up. So that shows you that if you use a reference edge and one reference surface, you can still get the lines to line up, all right? All right, so let's try and uh, put that, do, uh, apply that to this. So I have two lines. I always mark my material with uh, lines that are the square corner and a flat surface. So the head of my square is only going to go against this edge and against that surface. So uh, since I put that one inch mark here, I'll take my knife. And one of the things that you'll want to notice is that I have a single beveled knife and it's flat on one side and has the bevel on the other. And the way that I hold the knife when I actually cut the uh, shoulder line, when I bring that knife across, since this is the flat surface, that's a perpendicular cut and the angle is to the waist side, which is going to get cut away. So I'm going to go ahead and snug that up right against there. Now I'm going to make sure I put the head of my square against this flat surface and bring that line across like so. And then again I'm going to make sure the head of the square goes against the reference edge and across this way. And then again the head of the square goes against the reference face. And I'll have a nice line that matches up all the way around. Now, I'm going to go ahead and take my marking gauge. This is where I'm actually going to lay out the, where the, the mortise is lay, located and also the tenon is located. And when we uh, do that, we also only work off of one surface. And we work from the outside uh, to the first wall of the mortise and then set it up and uh, lay it out to the second wall of the mortise. And what I mean by that is I take the, uh, the marking gauge and I'll, you know, uh, choose a uh, dimension. The dimension doesn't really matter that much. Uh, let's see, I'll, 
Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to scribe a line from the end of the board down to my scribe line. But with this same setting now, with the same setting, I'm actually going to lay out the first set of lines for the tenon as well. So if I line these up now with the, uh, the outside edge against this, the leg, you'll notice that the line, those two lines are exactly in the same spot. And you know that's really important to make the fit of the, uh, the tenon. Now I'll go ahead and uh, do a second uh, line, which uh, now I usually like to like make the mortise, if I'm chopping mortises by hand, I like to make the mortise a little bit wider than what my mortise chisel is going to be so that I can come back and straighten the walls of the mortise. So the second mark will go on here. Again, I'm working off of the same outside surface and the same outside surface of the, uh, of, for the tenon. I'm going to run this back. Now, a good dimension to sort of keep in mind is that if you make the tenon one third the thickness of the material, that's approximately the thickness of the tenon that you would like to have. And you also want to be careful to make sure that the wall of the mortise isn't necessarily too close to the outside of the, uh, of the leg because if it uh, gets racked at all, it can have a tendency to break. All right, so one last line that we have to put in here for the mortise is uh, we don't want the mortise to come right out through the top of the, the leg. So if we come down approximately a half inch, I'll just measure this down a, a half inch here and put a mark there. I'm gonna bring my line across like this. Now one thing that you'll notice, um, and a lot of woodworkers do this, uh, is they uh, will scribe this line with a marking gauge off of the end of the board. And that isn't necessarily a good practice to uh, sort of uh, you know, employ because if you happen to have an angle on the end of a board like you see here, if I ran my marking gauge along that uh, angled edge, I would end up with an angled shoulder. And if I cut to those lines, what will happen is the leg will actually go together and be at an angle like you see here. And uh, unless we're trying to put a splay on, uh, for, on the leg, then uh, we don't want that to, to happen. We want, if we want, a, we want a line that's gonna be you know, perpendicular to a straight edge, which will bring the, the leg you know, right down uh, square and perpendicular to the floor. Okay, so these are all laid out now. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, show you how I chop the mortise. I'm gonna go over to the corner of the bench here. All right, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and chop a mortise. And we have to hold this, bent, this uh, piece down to the, the bench top as firmly as possible. And uh, the way that I do that is I like to use a clamp. Um, and I, I love these uh, Jorgensen style clamps because they you know, hold really well. A lot of people uh, have a little bit of difficulty using them, but uh, if you, you know, grab the, uh, the clamp the same way every time, and personally what I do is I put this, uh, this, handle in, uh, this upper handle in my right hand. If I rotate this in one direction, you can see that the clamp actually is, is closing up. And if I rotate it in the other direction, it's opening it up and it's also parallel. So what I want to do is I want to open this up to get it close to the, uh, the dimension that I need. And then I'm going to bring this over the bench and I'm going to go ahead and snug that up. And it, I always tighten it with the back piece here. And I want to make sure that these, these uh, jaws are perfectly parallel if they happen to be pinching you know, the, the, the clamp will move really quite easily, or if they're uh, pinching in the other direction, um, you know, it's not gonna hold the part snugly. So what I need to do is make sure that that's perfectly parallel. And then I tight it, tighten it down, a little moisture on my hand, get an extra quarter turn out of it. Now I'm gonna go ahead and take this mortise chisel, and I'm gonna begin by 
chopping approximately an eighth of an inch or, uh, or so away from the, uh, the scribe line that I made. And the other thing that I do when I chop these mortises is I always stand, you know, in this position here so that I can see how vertical the chisel is. It doesn't really matter too much if the chisel is angled in this direction to begin with because I'm away from the scribe line, but it is uh, necessary to be square when I'm looking at it from this direction because otherwise, you know, when I go to fit the mortise, uh, the tenon into the mortise, uh, it'll come off at an angle. So I'll go ahead and uh, try to center the chisel. Uh, you notice that I have the flat towards the, the uh, the scribe line and if I'm a little bit close to the scribe line I can do what you call walk the chisel so if I tilt it and twist it in my hand like so I can actually move it along to wherever I need it to be without really lifting it up and it makes it a little easier to get it in place now I'm going to stand back and make my first chop and then I'm going to spin the chisel around and when I make my chop this way what you're going to notice is it pushes the material that's uh, on the bevel side in that direction. It's actually splitting it along the side walls. And if you give it a little push in one direction towards the part that you chopped, it'll actually help to relieve the chip. And we'll just keep going until we get close to the end. And I'm going to come to within about an eighth of an inch on this end as well. And the reason for that is I need to sort of lever these this material out of here now and if I don't do that I'm going to bruise you know the edge if I go right up to the line. Get rid of most of this. Then we'll do the same thing over again. But we can be a little bit more aggressive now because we have to you know be able to go down about an inch so give that a good whack push it and that'll free up some of those that material that I'm chopping you notice that I'm not being too gentle here just trying to get that work done quickly Now, if I need to, I can, I can take my square and I can measure the depth by pushing this down inside of the opening. And that tells me that I'm about halfway there. So we'll just continue. Okay, we're getting close. See how far we made it on that one. We're probably a little, we've got about another eighth of an inch or so to go. All 
All right, this should take care of it. Okay, that's right at about an inch, so that's where we need to be. Now, what I need to do is I'm going to go ahead and change the uh, position of this so you can see a little bit better what I'm doing. I need to chop uh, to the lines on at the ends of the mortise now. And what I mean by that is I need to go ahead and put my chisel right in the scribe line. Now, you notice also that I am... Um, you know, chopping, and I'm able to look at the, uh, you know, this edge of the chisel to see that that's perfectly perpendicular to my work. And we'll just chop down this way. Let me do the other side. And we'll try to clean that out now without really marring up the ends if we can help it. Okay, I'm going to go back into the other position now. And I'm going to take a, a chisel. Maybe if I, you might be able to see it me better if I work at it this direction. I'm going to grab a wide chisel now, and if uh, you have one that's relatively long, you can also tell whether you're cutting perpendicular or not. So what I'm going to do now is put this chisel right in the scribe lines that I did with the marking gauge, and I want to go ahead and make a cut straight down on the sides. And this will square it off nicely. Now we got to be careful not to. We don't certainly don't want that, you know, that mortise to be going in on this direction or on that direction. We want it perf per perfectly perpendicular, uh, you know, to the surface. Clean that out. You want to make sure you close your eyes when you blow the material out of there. Now, one a couple of last checks that I make here is that when I uh, put this uh, square up against the edge, if I can see a little bit of a space there, that indicates to me that this wall is really, uh, you know, on an angle in this direction, and it would hold this the square away. So I would have to come back and clean that corner out, and I want to do it on this end as well. And uh, I don't know if you can quite see that, but. Um, we got a little here. Let me turn this so you can actually see it. You notice that I have this space right here, so that means that you know this is the end of this is touching down low, and I need to get inside there and clean that out. So we'll go ahead down inside here. One more check. Okay, one more time. Sometimes you can just use hand pressure at this point. And then I gotta make sure I work right over into the corners as well. Since the chisel is just slightly smaller than the opening now, <laughs> leaves a couple of cuts on either side. So that's what I need to do as far as the mortise is concerned. Now there's one other check that I do here. So if I take a, you know, a six inch ruler and I put this down inside of the, the mortise here, what this is gonna show you is that whether the sides of the mortise are perfectly square or not. So if I hold this up against the side of the the, uh, the mortise and I, and I sight it along this way, I can see that it's actually tilted over ever so slightly, so that means that that wall is on a slight angle. 
So I'm going to come back and take a little bit more from the just the bottom inside here. Clean out that material. And go ahead and check that again. That looks pretty good. Well, we'll check the other side. And I'm thinking that that's a little bit angled as well. Okay, so mortise is done. Now we're going to go ahead and go ahead and fit the uh, the tenon to the mortise. And what we have to do is we have to cut away the waste on either side, uh, and we'll do that with a rip uh, back saw. So I have uh, two saws here. I have a rip uh, saw that I can cut down along the side of the cheeks with, and then I have a cross cut back saw that I can cut the shoulders with. So we'll start off with the uh, the shoulder cuts. And what I'm going to do is hold this in the vise here, and I'm going to have it up high enough that I can still see my scribe lines. I'm going to take my crosscut saw, stay a sixteenth of an inch away from the line, and just go ahead and cut down until I just touch the scribe line on both sides. I'm going to flip that over and do it again. And that gives us our, our two uh, shoulder cuts that you see here. Now I'm going to hold this upright in the vise. And uh, what you're going to notice is that I'm not holding the, uh, the piece in the vise this way. Because if I, you know, if I uh, tighten this up in the vise and I have to start to make my cut, if it isn't holding it snug enough, the piece is going to move in this direction. So if I hold it in the vise with the edges facing towards me and towards the, uh, you know, the, the, that they face the, uh, uh, the, the jaws of the vise, I can come down this way and that's going to hold it good and solid. Now, when I, uh, when I uh, instruct people how to do this, sometimes what I suggest is that if you can make a, a saw cut from this corner down to this corner, and then the same on the opposite side, <coughs> excuse me, same on the opposite side, I can then spin it around and then come in from the opposite direction. Now again, I'm going to stay slightly away from the line so I can eventually uh, work to the line with a chisel or a, uh, a uh, shoulder plane. So I'm going to leave myself about a 30 second here, and I'm going to cut, try to cut nice and straight up and down. And I'll cut the opposite side as well. Got a little fat on that side, but we have to clean it up anyway. We'll spin that around, come in from the opposite direction. Now, since I made two angle cuts, what's going to happen is I made a cut from this corner to that corner, and then he made a cut from this corner to that corner. So basically I have this little uh, triangle that I have to come back and cut down to the shoulder, and when I do that, the part should just fall off. Do the other side here. <sighs> okay, so that's created the rough tenon for us. You'll notice that.
Now, if you look really uh, closely at this mortise and tenon and the lines that we have on here, you'll notice that I've left the scribe lines all around on, on the edges, on the ends, uh, and on the opposite edge. Now, those are really important lines to have because those are lines that I need to work to because if I chop to the lines on the mortise and if I can work to these lines on the tenon, the piece should fit perfectly, uh, just absolutely perfectly. So uh, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go uh, onto the bench and I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you two ways that I usually take care of a shoulder. And what I mean by taking care of a shoulder is I have this scribe line here right now and I have to cut to that line because that's the line that's going to actually make the distance between two parts. For instance, if I, uh, when I have a chair leg and I need to have the legs a certain distance apart, you know, that's what really makes the, uh, the dimension that I'm after. So again, I'm going to hold this down to the bench and I always want to make sure that the, the part is over the bench and not hanging over the bench because if I chop too hard here, I could actually, you know, break off the tenon. So I want to make sure that that is um, on top of the bench. And I'll hold this in place. And again, I'm going to stand to the side. Since I have the scribe line here, if I put my chisel in the line in this direction, and I can be looking at it from this spot here, I want to make sure that that's perfectly perpendicular. I can just come down like so. And the other thing is, is you know, it's really important that we had this scribe line because I can put that chisel right in that scribe line and it won't, it won't move at all. And, you know, that's what's really making, going to make this, that's what's really going to make this joint fit. And we'll get rid of a little bit of that material there. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from the position on the bench over to the, uh, the vise here. And I'm going to hold the piece perpendicular in the vise. And I'm going to take my paring chisel. This has about a 15 degree angle on it. So it's a, a lot steeper and it creates a much sharper edge. But uh, when I go to cut to the shoulder, what I'm able to do is to take and put the, uh, the chisel right against the uh, material and so I drag it up, it just drops into that line and I'm able to just make a cut in in this direction. And then once I have that established, then I just come along and only take about an eighth of an inch cut from the side with each cut. And we work right along here. and cut that off and then trim that up a little bit. So that'll give us a nice shoulder. Now the thing that we really have to be conscious of is to make sure that that shoulder is at right angles or square in this direction. If it's not, if it's not square and it's angling up in this direction, I'm gonna, when I go to actually assemble a piece into the mortise, there'll be a space along the very edge. So it's really important to make that cut perfectly square. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and try and uh, I'll show you two ways that I uh, generally will clean up these, uh, these cheeks. I can do it one with a wide chisel where I take and put the chisel right in the, the scribe line here and make sure the edge is above the shoulder and I just sort of rock my way through till I get about halfway. Then I turn it around and come in from the other direction. Get that chisel right in the scribe line. And I can see the, the, the scribe line on the end of the board, so that's what I'm really concentrating on. And then I need to make a cut across this way to make those parts fall away and then come back and true it up a little bit. <sighs> okay, I'm going to use what we call a shoulder plane. Now if I hold the, uh, the piece in the vise and 
so that it's above the bench top. This shoulder plane has to be adjusted uh, extremely accurately. Um, if I happen to set it up and the edge of the blade is sticking out slightly more on one side than it is uh, the other, uh, it's going to put an angle into the mortar or into the tenon. And if I have, uh, if it's angled towards the shoulder, it's going to make sort of a dovetail shape. If it's angled towards the out end, the outer end of the tenon, it's going to make a tapering shape. So when I set this up, I look at the uh, the uh, the projection of the blade to make sure that it's sticking out uh, evenly all the way across. So that when I make my cuts going across this way. I want to make sure that I'm not putting any angle into it. Get a little bit more blade. This is a little bit more controlled. And you notice that I'm very deliberate that I come up and make the, the uh, you know, engage the cut and then follow through. And as I progress, what I do now is I look at the, I look at the, the line. Uh, the line is good and parallel. And I want to look at it on the end. It's a little thinner here than it is at this end. So that indicates to me that that tenon is slightly angled in this direction. So it's thicker here than it is here. So I'm going to concentrate my efforts now right in this area. So I'll just make partial cuts going across. Now, if you look closely here, when I get close to my line, you'll notice that this is starting to flake away. You can actually see, you know, where the scribe line was made here. And I've taken it away at this end and it's still a little thick here. So that indicates to me that it's actually flaring out a bit. So I'm going to focus my work right on the very end here with a couple of thin cuts. Now, this is a really a good trick. Um, when we go to fit this into the mortise, it's going to fit into the mortise this way because this, is my, this was my reference edge, which has this little swirl on it. But if I take the part and I spin it around like so and hold that up against my mortise, I can actually tell, if we look here, you can actually see, I can still tell that there's just a little bit, just a little bit of the mortise sticking out. So what that indicates to me is that the, the distance from this uh, outside surface to the, the cheek is, is not quite deep enough. So if I go back to my vise and take a little bit more material, from this end over here, I should be in pretty good shape. And again, I'm going to spin this around. It's lining up with the mortise now. You notice when I rub my finger there, I can see that it's nice and uh, parallel. So I want to try and fit it now until it goes into the opening this way. And that actually fits pretty good. All right, so the last thing that we have to do is to cut a shoulder into this that allows for what we left on the top of the leg. So I'm going to take a pencil and I'm going to hold this up against the uh, mortise. I'm going to put a little line here and then I'm going to take my square and if I put that against the shoulder line, I should be coming off of there perpendicular and that'll be the cut that I need to make. So I'm going to make my rip cut first. I mean, you know, vertical and I'm going to go right along that line. And then I'll go ahead and make my cross cut. And I'm going to leave a sixteenth of an inch away from the scribe line. 
Now, you'll notice that I have this little uh, projection where I didn't cut quite up to the line, so I need to put this upright in my vise again, and then take my paring chisel, put it right in the scribe line, and scribe across this way here making sure that's perfectly parallel. Now I want to make sure that the corners of the tenon are cleaned really well. And then I'm also going to take my shoulder plane and I'm going to bevel the top of the tenon. And what that does is it, when I go to assemble this, it'll actually, the uh, bevel will make it funnel into the, uh, the opening. Clean up the end a little bit, and this should just hopefully just fit in there nicely now. All right, so you'll notice that it isn't quite seating, so there must be something inside of the mortise, which I think is probably the, the case. Oh yeah, I can see it down inside there. So I'm going to go ahead and try to get down inside there with my mortise chisel. Oh yeah, big old piece down in the corner there that I missed. There we go, look at that, that's beautiful. Okay, so what we wanna do now is, uh, you know, this is how all these mortise and tenons would have been put together. Now, if uh, you have a little bit of a, uh, you know, a problem, I think I got a, a little bit of a shoulder that's not quite seated correctly. So I'm going to just rescribe this shoulder ever so slightly and recut it. And that'll allow me to have a good flat surface because I noticed that there's a little, uh, a little difference in the height of these shoulders. So uh, just to rescribe this ever so slightly. If I do, if you're making a table or something like this, you would have to do it to the opposite uh, parts as well. A lot of times when I chop on, when I'm on the bench, um, I find that some of the edges crush a little bit, so. This is a much, I, I prefer actually pairing the shoulder with a chisel like this. And come back this way. Know what this is? They call that industrial art. <laughs> yeah. All right, then we'll flip this around and we'll create a little more industrial art here. Coming in from the other direction. Coming in from the end. That's cleaned well. Let's see how it fits. Ah, that's much better. I'm happier with that. All right. So what, the other thing that I'd like to show you uh, before we finish up here is, uh, in the old days, they didn't have any kind of clamps or anything in order to hold these things together. So what they did was a process by which they called draw boring. And what that means is I drill a hole through the mortise and then I assemble the tenon into the mortise and I mark where the, uh, uh, the hole is and then offset it ever so slightly so that when I drive a wooden nail or a pin in there, it'll actually pull it uh, snugly and hold it together. So let me get out a couple of tools here so that I can uh, 
go ahead and uh, drill that hole. First of all, I'm going to find the center mark. And I'm going to come in. Uh, I want to be in about a quarter of an inch off the shoulder. So I'm going to go ahead and make a mark here about a quarter of an inch in. And I want the edge of the hole to be at that quarter inch mark. So I'm going to revert to a, uh, a cordless drill here just to make things a little simpler. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and drill that hole so that the, uh, the hole is right alongside of the, uh, the quarter inch mark that I made. So I have a drill set up here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and drill all the way through here. And sometimes what I like to do is I like to at least put a piece of wood in, in the back here so it doesn't split out too much when I'm drilling through this. So I'll go ahead and get the drill. I'm using a nice little brad point drill here. And I'm going to drill it all the way through to the other side. Okay, now you can, you can see there's a hole that goes all the way through that. Now I'm going to go ahead and assemble my, my mortise and tenon. And I'm going to use this brad point bit and I'm going to go ahead and mark where the center of that is. Now, when I, when I mark that center, which you can see here, you can see that that's the center right there. Now, if you think about this, if I drill the hole right in the same place, you know, it'll just basically go through. But if I offset the hole slightly like this, what happens is I have the wall of the hole that's going through the tenon is slightly closer to the shoulder so that when I drive the pin in, it'll push against the side of that hole and draw the whole thing together, we hope. Let's give it a try. So I'm going to offset this hole now ever so slightly by about a sixteenth of an inch or so. And now let's see if we can see what's going on in here. Now I don't know if you can see inside of here or not, but you can actually should be able to see that part of the hole on the tenon is slightly closer to the shoulder. Okay. Now we have to go ahead and make a pin. So you want to choose a nice uh, hard piece of hardwood of some sort. I have a piece of ash on the, the bench over here. Uh, and I need to make a quarter inch pin. So I'm going to go ahead and set my marking gauge to a quarter of an inch. And I'm going to make a couple of lines. I'm going to try to choose a nice straight grained area. So this is pretty, has some nice straight grain on it. So I'm going to go ahead and make a line in this direction. And then again, another one in this direction. And I'll go ahead and cut those. I'm going to need a little bit bigger saw to do that. So let me grab that. I'm going to put the lines on the top, though, so I can see what I'm doing. Well, let me grab a little bit wider saw. So what I have here is a, uh, a tenon saw. And a tenon saw tends to be a little bit wider than a dovetail saw. I was able to cut, cut the uh, tenon with the dovetail saw because I was only going an inch or so. I'm going to need to have a little bit more material for this, uh, this pin, so uh, I'm going to use something a little bit wider. So I'm going to go ahead and cut down along the side here at a quarter of an inch. Go ahead and spin this and cut this from the opposite direction now.
And then we'll cut this, this off of here with a cross cut saw. And that's going to give me my quarter inch pin. Now, you'll notice that the pin, I haven't quite gotten to the line there, so I need to put this in the vise in plane uh, to the quarter inch mark. So I'll go ahead and try to grab that like so. Grab my plane. Get down to my line. Pretty close, a little bit more on this end. Well, if you're having trouble holding it, another way to do this is to flip the plane upside down. And push the piece across. Okay, and then we'll get rid of the saw marks on this side. Now I'm going to go ahead and leave this square because it. Uh, I'm going to put a square pin into a round hole. Now, one of the things that we have to be conscious of is we're going to, we need to taper the end of the pin. And we want to taper it in a, in a way that it favors one side of the pin, of the, uh, the pin itself. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, sort of s turn this into an octagon, whittle it down. And then I'm going to heavily whittle it on one side so that I can get the pin beyond that offset hold that's in the tenon. That's why we make the pin extra long as well. Now you can, you'll notice that this is favoring one side. So it's heavy on, the taper is heavy on one side so that when I put this into the, uh, the opening here, it's going to miss the, uh, the, miss the, uh, the offset of the hole. Now, when we go to uh, drive this in, we want to use a hammer, a good heavy hammer. And we want to make sure, I think I gotta taper that a little bit more. One of the problems that you can have is if you drive this pin in, it can hit the other side of the hole and it would hit the end of the pin and stop it from uh, you know, going all the way through. And if that happens, sometimes the pin will break off inside of the hole and uh, you have to drill it out and it just is, makes it a little bit more difficult. So that's looking pretty good now. Now when I go to drive this pin home, I want to put it over a hole on the bench, make sure it's sitting good and flat, and then we just drive that right through like so. And I mean you can't get anything much stronger than that, it's unbelievable. And usually on some of the older pieces of furniture that you find, they leave the pin sticking out like this. They don't use any glue, you can knock that out, take the piece of furniture apart. So, and then another little decorative element that they might put onto the top would be a little, uh, a little pyramid here. And that would accent the pin. And if you burnish it a little bit with another piece of wood, make it look like it's 200 years old. So that's what we have now. If uh, we needed to, we can certainly plane off the top of, uh, you know, the rail to meet the top of the leg just by passing a plane across here.
And there we have it, one more to Centennial. Thanks for being with me. I'm Phil Lowe at the Furniture Institute of Massachusetts, and this is The Art of Woodworking. Mm -hmm.